The title is Hindrances to Changing into the New Season, and it's part one. So this morning, you're going to really be empowered. Is that right, church? Amen. The first uh, scripture reference today is Jeremiah 17, verse 7. And we're looking at it from the modern King James Version. The modern. Did you know that there's a modern version as well? Ah, there. It's a modern King James Version. It says, Blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah. Isn't that wonderful? He says, and Jehovah is his trust. So how awesome is it that when we develop trust in the Father, that we keep our trust. And it's like Father's Day today. All the children and the wives, they trust the Father. Is that not true? And we're going to sing for all the fathers just now. They definitely need some singing. Is that not right? We definitely need to bless our fathers today. Amen. And we're going to do that uh, before we leave the building. So remember, God says change is a process. And remember, process that many people find difficult. So it's from level to level to level, and it's a process, and in all the processing, something gets developed in our heart so that we can contain and manage the blessing. Managing the blessing has to have building blocks in it. It has to have stabilizing factors in it, and the stabilizing factors that are in the building of managing the process from process to process and from level to level. And we're going to look at that. Change is necessary for reaching your destiny. Remember, we all have a great destiny God has got for us. But remember that the destiny needs to be attained through process after process after process. Don't you just love the fact that God says that the giftings on our lives make room for us? And it's because we develop skills through the giftings. And those skills that are developed through the giftings causes us to become more able and more able to manage what God has got for us. Amen? And so if we are not changing, remember, we are not growing. And growing is definitely part of the processing that we need to continue in the goodness of God, right? Amen? And so we are to build for the battles we face on a daily basis. So building in influence, building in inner strength, building in uh, the wisdom, the application of applying information causes us to um, face every battle in a successful way. Amen? Is that right? So 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5, can you give me more sound? Uh, 5 verse 5, the New Living Translation, it says God himself has prepared us for this. So whatever we're facing right now, what we're building in right now, God has prepared us for this very thing. And he says, and as a guarantee, he has given us the Holy Spirit. So we don't have to do anything on our own. The Holy Spirit will show us this is the next step to take. This is how we do this. That's what is needed. And we identify what is needed for us to manage. Now, you know, I just love um, when my grandkids want to bake. And so their favorite is to bake scones. But now they like to jump on the cupboard, on the working cupboard that we work, and they want to see all the detail. And then as the detail develops, they've got their fingers in it and they are tasting all the way along. Isn't that wonderful? So by the time we actually put the scones in the tray, we've got uh, batter just about everywhere. And of course, the two youngest ones, they like to compete in getting helping with a mixing of everything. And so it is wonderful. And then, of course, you know, they don't want us to take the bowls or the tools to the basin. They want to clean it and lick it off themselves. <laughs> so you can imagine the competition. 
And you know, God is like that. He says his word becomes manna to us. And once we taste it, we enjoy the word so much that we can't be without what it does for us. Because the inner peace we develop as we receive the promises of God, gives us, satisfies us. And it's like the children with the batter and baking. And then, of course, we've got this huge big competition of guarding the oven because now they start seeing it raise. Uh, you know, the, the, the little uh, muffins start to just rise like that. And then you've got to stop the ones that are most adventurous to open the door and look. Because the minute they're going to open it, everything's going to fall flat. So we've got to read them their rights. This is the rules of, of watching and uh, seeing what is developing before you. And you know, God, I can just imagine God. God, our Father, Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ sitting next to him as the high priest and watching the progress on each and every one of our lives. Oh, so they've applied it by the stripes of Jesus. You are healed. Just look how, look at the results. Let's give them a little extra. Let's just help them a little bit more so that they see that this manna from heaven works. And this is this guarantee that the Word of God, just a good description, part of it, there's many illustrations. God Himself has prepared us for this. Now think of the preparation. From the minute you meet the Holy Spirit, and from the minute that the Word of God becomes real in your life, you cannot be without it. And if you are without it and you've neglected meditating in the word of God, your old man rises and your old ways rise again that cause you so much sorrow. Isn't that sad? So we can see that our conduct becomes of the old. Our words that we use become the, the old. The threatening each other, the bailing out, all of the old rises up which causes us much sorrow. Is that not true? Who's experienced that? Yes. Amen. And so without the Holy Spirit, we can't win. But now let's have a look at verse 6. It says, so we are always confident. Everyone say confident. You don't face a battle without confidence. You don't get married without confidence. Is that right? Because we found out that the stars and the moon don't always work together with us. Is that right? Amen. And the butterflies don't always land on our heads. If we didn't enter into that agreement with the right focus and the right reliance, is that not right? Amen. So at the beginning stages of a relationship, we're talking relationship. You have that wonderful feeling that comes over your, your whole being. If you just hear the voice of the person that you fall in love with. Anybody had that twinkling butterfly, a little raw? And I'm sure that the guys felt that they had more muscle when they just heard that little voice. They suddenly, they just felt strong. They could take the world. Take the world, amen? <laughs> If the love, and if she just gave you that special smile, it just turned your knees into a different appearance, a little bit sort of more sort of jellyish. She could ask you for anything at that moment. Is that right? And you know what? This love that God talks about literally puts God in a position where he just wants to bless you. He wants you to be confident that he will always have your back. He will always cover you. He will always protect you. But it's us that draw away to ourselves. And when we draw away we don't have all of that rescue plan that we need in our lives to survive in such an evil world. So in verse 6, it says, so we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. Because we get to manage these bodies. We get to manage the territory God has put your footsteps on. 
You chose to live there, now you get to manage that place. Is that right? No one's going to come and clean your floors. No one's going to make sure that it's a happy place except you and your agreement with what God has assigned for you. So can you see how much God has given you? He has given you the land and he wants you to influence it. Wherever you are and wherever you go, influence it with what he's put inside you. So you don't have to go and look for it. It is inside of us. And the more we draw closer to him, the more we respond like him. Amen. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we live by believing. How do we live? By believing. But if we look at what it seems like, uh, which is temporary, we will really be blown away and really be discouraged. But by believing what he said, complete, lacking nothing, is what God wants you to hold on to. And that restores your confidence. Having confidence really changes everything. It reminds me of um, we uh, grew up and uh, we from the era where our brothers all went to the army and it was an 18 months stretch in the army. And so, yeah, these matrics finished and it was first army before they could go to university. And so for 18 months, you never knew when you'll see them. You never knew if you'll see them nine months from now or eight months from now, wherever they were uh, uh, sort of sent out. Um, obviously, um, you wanted to sort of get a, a sort of knowing of what is it like in the army. And I think the very first thing is that they sought out one thing for starters, you are not in control. <laughs> and they would try and bring to your understanding if you join the army, you are nothing. Is that not right? So then they start to rebuild the foundations of how you should be thinking, how you should be responding, and how faithful you should be. Otherwise, there'll be consequences. And I think a few of uh, the men, the young troopers, they decided to AWOL and, uh, for that weekend. And so those were still the days where they could, from Kimberley, uh, could still hark to get home. Is that not right? So you never knew when they would arrive. And you just had this pounding on the door because they're so glad. They've walked all night. They've walked another day. And they've walked another night just to be home for a few hours. And then obviously get back to wherever they were posted, whether it was Bloemfontein or Kimberley or wherever it was, but it was quite a thing. But think if we had to ever be without the Lord at any stage of our lives, we would not have hope, we would not have confidence, and we, will, we would definitely be leaning more over to what we see instead of what we believe. Is that not right? Amen. And so some have lived in seasons of winter. And seasons of winter is not all that pretty. Seasons of winter is when joy is gone, hope is gone. There's nothing to look forward to. There's no new growth. There's no flowers. There's no pretty. Just think how excited we get when we know that um, the new season is approaching. Spring. When all the spring flowers come out and all the fruit trees have got beautiful blossoms and all the new heads of the irises and all the beautiful flowers are starting to show the appearance of new life. And you know, we like new life, don't we? We like new things to come our way because that is how God designed for us to be. And so, but he wants us to give attention. Or have we found a season that we're living in stuck in winter where there's no hope there's nothing new coming, only just negative things are in your life. And there are five hindrances to change in our lives. I want us to give attention to the hindrances today so that we can walk into the beautiful new season God has got for us, hopeful and full of confidence. 
Five hindrances. If we don't give attention to it, this will truly keep us captive in a winter season if we don't give attention to it. And the very first hindrance to change is pride. And do we know how pride can keep people in captivity? Pride is a, is a yoke. Pride is a destiny a thief. Because pride will not, it will put us in a rejected position and uh, not, in actual fact, uh, uh, a blessing position. Because whoever is prideful, you just don't want to listen to them anymore. You just want to push them out of your sight and you just don't want much to do with that. Is that not right? And you can't, even a leader that leads many people cannot have pride. Because no one will follow them. Is that not true? Because pride and self-righteousness is brother and sister. And we want to hear the voice of our Father, not man's perception. Is that not true? And so a second uh, uh, yoke that will hinder change is fear. Because fear can be tangible. Fear can be so tangible that it can contaminate our surroundings. The fear of loss or the fear of not being understood or the fear of um, not being liked would put you in a lesser position and you can't lead anybody to victory if fear is too prominent. The fear of the future, the fear of not having enough. Those things can be really, really huge big giants in people's lives. Rebellion, number three, we all know what rebellion looks like, right? Rebelling God, you're helping them, you're blessing them, but you, you bypass a house. How come they've got new paint and we don't have? <laughs> that could be a little bit of rebellion in the heart, not realizing that we have responsibility. So rebellion, no one can tell them anything. Is that right? A very big giant is laziness. Laziness, not wanting to go out and do it. Just experiment at least. Take the word and apply it and work the word is what the word of God says. And a very sad hindrance is ignorance. Ignorance, not realizing that God has got a good future for you. And we miss out on the blessing. Is that not true? So ignorance, not knowing what is God intended for you to enjoy in the future and on a daily basis. And we don't want to be ignorant. Is that right? Amen to that. So locating these hindrances in our lives and committing to get rid of them. And remember, rid of them, they could be strongholds, they could be yokes, they could be, you could drive just to prove to you, you could be driving through a, 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 maybe a township or a city and you become very aware that there's poverty that is hovering in that territory. Now that means there's a strong man that holds the keys of people's prosperity there. And it could be one of those hindrances, ignorant of what does the word say about it. Pride, maybe pride, no one will tell me how to look after my children. And maybe the children don't even have shoes to go to school. And it could be something they could tap into to get extra help. But pride withholds them from inquiring. So we can see that all of these hindrances have robbed many people and kept them in a winter season instead of a beautiful, abundant summer season where there's enough. And committing to get rid of them will put you in the path to change. Now that's identification. If we can identify, we can see and we can manage what we identify. So the only way to change is truly by renewing your mind with what God says about your situation. Amen to that. If God says, I call you blessed, then you believe it. 
and you take that as a promise. And he says, I will bless you and not put sorrow on you. Then you believe it and you say goodbye to sorrow. If he says, I have a wonderful, a good future for you, then start becoming hopeful of a good future. Because remember, you have gifts in your life that will make room for you. It will put you in a strategic place with strategic people. And they might say, I want what is on this man's life. I'm going to promote him. I'm going to make him an offer that he cannot refuse. And that is beautiful because you are not living in a winter environment by the way you're thinking. You're thinking wherever I go, God will make room for me. The blessing has my name on it. And you know, how about waking up in the morning and say, the new season is beginning this morning and it's starting with the words I'm using. This new season is starting where we are saying increase is coming our way. Financially, we are increasing in stature. The Lord is the one that blesses us. He causes the blessing to come our way. And so our mouths have a lot to do with whatever season we find ourselves in. Amen. And so Romans 12, remember we said renewing of the mind. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore. That means God is calling us to his attention. Brothers, by the mercies of, the, of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. So serving God means that he wants us to be all in and say that we are willing to build the way God wants us to build. And so we are living sacrifices. Is that right? And we want to be pleasing, upright, and holy in the presence of our Father. So that means we want to get rid of our stinking thinking. Is that right? Anybody recognize that there could be moments that stinking thinking visits us? Amen. When we start getting dissatisfied about something, we open the fridge and we're dissatisfied that there isn't a, maybe a cheesecake or a chocolate cake that says to you, good morning. Amen. <laughs> or you open the sweetie cupboard and there are your wonderful chips that you really have had a desire to eat for Youngs. But anyway, so stinking thinking is definitely under our feet. Is that right, family? <laughs> Romans 12 verse 2 says, and do not be conformed. That means don't receive the blueprint on your mind to this world. But be transformed. That means transformed means that you are singled out and put in position for what God says. Don't be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's start that again. Romans 12 verse 2, it says, and do not be conformed to this world. That means get stuck in a rut in doing it only that way. But be transformed by doing something by the renewing of your mind in order to prove Prove, prove, it's got to, you've got to see it by you, what is that good and that pleasing and that perfect will of God. Well, we found out that God's got a covenant with us, is that right? We found out that this morning that God's loving, gracious mercies are new every day. That he wants us to be blessed every day with sufficient, more than enough. So pleasing and perfect will of God is to bless you and to put the blessing on your life. And so inquiring more knowledge, information of what does God say about us doesn't mean that your mind is being renewed, but... Renewing your mind is an ongoing process. So it doesn't just automatically just happen. It's by listening to what he says and then doing what he says. That takes place by applying the word 
to your thinking so that your mindset can change. Right? Mindset. And I know this is an incredibly good uh, topic today. Our mindsets. The renewing of our minds. We love to hear this, right? We're so excited about the word this morning, aren't we? Yeah. Amen. Because it's putting responsibility back in our uh, posse. We realize there's something I need to do. So when we identify, we realize there's something I can do about this. So I'm not going to sit and wait for it just to happen. I'm going to do something about it. Amen. Amen. You know, I want to share something. We'd gone through a little dry season in the early days of our lives. And we had a sort of uh, almost like a light, creamy a lounge suite. And the kids were really making a dirty. And we were clinging this cream, beautiful lounge suite every week. And it became such a taxing thing. And I was sitting and I was thinking, what can I do to change this? Because who likes to clean a lounge suite every week by cleaning it? Pastor Shami has a good chuckle because she knows where it's going. And I was standing in the pharmacy and I saw all the different, uh, different colored dyes, little tubs like that. And I saw shocking pink and I saw yum yum yellow and I saw green and I saw blue. And Willem, you would have loved it. And <laughs> And all sorts of colors. And I decided I've never done this in my life before, but I'm going to try. And it says you've got to add salt to it. Because I thought, how will it stay? I tell you, I took a milk jug. I took a brush, a brush that you normally wash your pots with. I cleaned it. I boiled the water. I put a tub in and I got the staff to help me. And we took this out into the paving, into the hot sun. It was a lovely sunny day. And we started, and I thought, let me first start with the back part of it, because that can go against the wall if this doesn't work. <laughs> so um, I did color by color. <laughs> and I thought, well, I, can't, yeah, I just have so much dye. This is a lot of furniture, a three-seater plus a two-seater plus a two chairs. So I thought, this has really got to work, and it's got to go everywhere. So I started, so I had spectators, and of course I went, whoosh, whoosh, splash, splash, and go to the next one, splash, 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 and there was still paint left for the front, and then I started with the front. So we started with the shocking pink first, and then we went for the yellow, and then we went for the blue, and then we went for the green, and I tell you, I looked back and I thought, this is spectacular. Now I have to hear what my husband's got to say when he gets home. It was all dry and it was gorgeous. Anyway, we saved so much money by doing that. Splish, splash, splish and splash, and it was very unique. There was none of that in the shop. And do you know that that lounge suite lasted so well and it was so spectacular and it saved us a lot of clinging because you couldn't see any spot go on it because we had all these diverse rainbow colors all over and it was unique. So what is that thought pattern? I believe the Holy Spirit gave me a way out that morning. Because I was pretty desperate. I thought, I don't feel like cleaning this furniture week after week, and it's becoming a misery. So we decided we've got to fix this problem. And one morning we woke up, and I looked at my son's bedroom, and I thought, he really needs paint in this room. And I had a small tub of blue paint, and I decided I heard that they wash walls with a sponge and paint. Willem. <laughs> Willem is going, now I wonder what would that look like? Let me tell you, it was spectacular. Watered that whole paint down. We had five liters of paint, runny, watery paint, but a sponge dipping it in it and washing the walls. It looked like marble, but blue marble. And you know what? There's always a way 
if you will just hear what is the Holy Spirit saying to you. He will always guide your footsteps and you'll always have a solution. And it will be so unique and so direct and absolutely a blessing. And you know what? We sold that house with that wool and that room like that. And they even asked us for the curtains as well. They asked us, would you please tell us how you did this? Because we like it so much. It sold the house. So can you imagine? The evidence that your mind is renewed is really what God is looking for. He wants us to walk with the evidence that he is in control. And you don't respond in the same way to the old temptations. You don't respond to it. Because once you become solid and you become steadfast, you are not moved by the little things that come your way, but you move by the potential God puts in you. So how can we respond like Jesus is a very good question. I just think, how amazing was that? There God is ministering to the multitudes in the hot sun. And he recognizes that it's lunchtime. He realizes that they are hungry. The babies and the little ones must have started crying. And then he decided there must be a way. So he talks to his, his leaders, his disciples that have been with him and seen miracles. He says, go among them and let's feed the people. They are saying, Jesus, we better get food to these people. They are hungry. How are we going to feed them? And he says, go and have a look and see what have we got. They thinking, let's go into town and go and buy food. Meantime, he knows that the miracle is on its way. A little boy that left his home. So how does God think? How does God plan in a very unique, in a very special way? That little boy is let to go out for the day by his mom with fish and bread in his little, I don't think they were Tupperwares, his little basket. And he's got just enough for him for the day. And there he comes past the multitude and they find out that there's food. They bring it to the front. And God blesses the food. And he fills the baskets with food. Enough for everyone to eat. So we can clearly see that our God is not bound by anything. But we are bound by the words we use. God can turn everything within your care into a miracle. And how does Jesus respond? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5. God himself has prepared us for this. He's prepared us for change. He's prepared us for more. He's prepared us for the renewal. And he says, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we've got all the help on our side to be able to have renewal and to have the blessing that God has for us. The Holy Spirit created you and me, and he knows how we put together. Job, in the book of Job 33 verse 4, the, uh, the Spirit of God made me. Job said it so well. And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So we've got the breath of the Almighty inside of our mouths and we get to decide, are we going to allow him to have a voice in our lives or are we going to allow doom and gloom to have a voice in our lives? So change comes by the potential of the Holy Spirit ignited in us, leading and guiding us. And Paul wrote this so well, the following saying, in John 6, verse 63, he wrote there, It is the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. So words birth the new. And if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to birth the Lord's sayings, we don't have the breath of God working for us.
And so we can see how important it is to allow the breath of God to speak the blessing over our lives and not to give place a foothold to Satan's destructive work of doom and gloom in our lives. The Holy Spirit is always authored and he authors the word of God in our lives. Remember we say, let the Holy Spirit teach us. He's our teacher. He's our comforter, but he's our teacher as well. So without the word being taught to us through the Holy Spirit, we won't profit and have the blessing like we should. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, the Amplified says, All scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction. Isn't that beautiful? So a good way to say... What's the instruction of the Lord on our lives today? Right? And it's for conviction. He also points out where there's a spot in our lives. Where's where's a wrinkle? And this is not the mirror now. It's for the correction of error and restoration to obedience. Now think about restoration to obedience, how that changes our lives. For training in righteousness. So all of us are in training at the moment. We're training for the best day when we see the Lord. We're all in training. Amen to that? Learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately. Behaving honorably, with personal integrity and moral courage. So did you hear that personal integrity? Isn't that beautiful? And moral courage. I love the amplified version of this particular verse. Verse 17 says, So that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we're in the school at the moment so that we will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Isn't that a beautiful view to see the word, how it benefits us? It benefits us in such a beautiful way. It equips us for every good work. Hallelujah. And he wants us to be outfitted and thoroughly equipped for his good work. So we are to dedicate our bodies to God as a sacrifice. And when we sacrifice the things that could be harmful and rather choose to walk with him, we're walking with a renewal that brings us to new things. When we renew our minds, we prove what is acceptable to God through our conduct. And think about that, making no room for anything that will steal our joy. Making no room for anything that will steal our potential. Negativity tries to remove the beauty that God has got for us, the blessing. So the word must go deep into our spirit man. Otherwise, we won't think differently And we won't make better decisions. Is that true, family? And so we can see today that the word is the only thing that has the power to penetrate our heart. Nothing else can penetrate it like the word. Because remember that the word is all powerful. Is that not right? So we want to change the way we think negatively. Uh, feeling abandoned, rejected, despondent, negative. The only thing that is going to change it is not people, but the word. Because God's going to, and once we've got the word right in our heart, it makes room for us in quality relationships and places of great power and influence. 
Isn't that awesome? Second Corinthians 5, 7. It says, that is why we live, by believing and not by seeing. Amen to that? Believing and not by seeing. And it's because what is the word? Yeah, we've got the good word again. Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is living, right? And it's powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't that beautiful? So that means all those negative thoughts Satan is trying to put in your mind, the minute you listen to what God says, it cuts the negative, destructive force of Satan off of your life. And it says, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, two ways, right? Piercing even to the dividing part of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I love that. It's a complete package. Isn't that awesome? If you think how complete the package is, that the Word of God can remove negative, can remove what is deathly against you, can reveal the truth to you at the same time, and even give you discernment to the thoughts that we're holding on to. I love that. Jeremiah 31 verse 16 says, But now the Lord says, Do not weep any longer. That means don't believe the negativity and the destructive force that has kept you in captivity. For I will reward you, says the Lord. Your children will come back to you from the distant land of the enemy. So when God comes and he's in control of something, it changes every dynamic of our lives. It removes disapproval, it removes separation, it removes rejection, it removes abandonment, because it pierces the lie that the enemy is trying to keep us in slavery. And so you know what? This day, we are choosing not to remain in slavery. Is that right? We don't want to be slaves to that lesser plan that Satan has tried to enforce in our lives. And you know what? If you go home and you need pain for the front door, say, this is about to change. Start prophesying over the door. Say, this paint is coming in Jesus' name. If you look at those gutters that are like barely holding on for dear life, just say that these gutters are going to be renewed in Jesus' name. The blessing of the Lord is coming. You go through that front a gate that is maybe not standing sturdy or whatever, just say, I speak this in line in Jesus' name. And obviously there comes a time we've got to roll up the sleeve too. We can't just prophesy, we've also got to do the part that prophecy can come to pass. But you might be standing there and you hear someone says to you, you know what, I've got an extra tin of varnish. Do you need varnish? Yes, I do. Thank you. And there the Lord already provides. It could be that the person says, I'm throwing some steel out today and he's your neighbor. And he says, do you need any steel before I throw it away? And there's the steel you need to put your gate together. Whatever it might be, God is the source of your everything. You might just find that a person just comes past and, say, and is recommended, comes highly recommended as an incredible worker. Someone who is gifted, who can do woodwork, can do steel work, can paint, can do glass work and everything. And he's got a few days free. And there you go. And God provides a way out. Amen to that. But if we're not going to prophesy, we're not going to change the season. You have to literally go and prophesy. You might even have to go to the love of your life today and say, I prophesy that you adore me and that nothing, nothing disrupts our sleep. And it could be that they are great snorer keeping you awake at night. 
<laughs> so you have to start prophesying. I prophesy tonight is going to be a peaceful evening. And you just love to sleep without singing in the middle of the night by snoring. <laughs> but if you're not willing to prophesy, you're not going to see the change. Amen. Might be that you have to prophesy that your kids are not always hungry. <laughs> That they are satisfied by the food you give them. Amen. <laughs> Jeremiah 31 verse 17 gives us hope. There is hope for your future. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is restoring your hope for the future? Instead of fear that your hope is restored. Could be that one of you have made a mistake and somehow the mistake is never forgotten. But let me tell you, God is restoring your hope. He removes whatever the enemy uses to separate families. And he restores their hope again. Your children will come again to their own land. I call the inheritance forth this morning. I call your divine orchestrated inheritance forth this morning that you occupy the land God has chosen for you to dwell in. Fully paid for without being a slave to any bank, any financial system. That the blessing will overtake you in Jesus' name. And you know, God is a restorer of our hope. But if we consistently only see the dark, we will never live in hope and never establish our footsteps in what he says about it. He says, there is hope for your future. And you know what? We need to start prophesying that over each other. Because if we can't see a future, then we're not making ready for the blessing. Amen. So Jeremiah 40 verse 4 is what we're going to be closing with. Uh, almost it says, and, but I am going to take off your chains and let you go. Isn't that good news? Amen. What has been holding you back? God says he's taking the chains off and let you go. Why? Because your character is growing. The character, a godly character in you is growing. Amen. You're no longer what you used to be. You are growing in the statures of your father, your heavenly father, which is a good example for you. Amen to that. And he says, but if you want to come with me to Babylon, you are welcome. He says, see the sea part. I will see that you are well cared for. But if you don't want to come, you may stay here. The whole land is before you. Go wherever you like. And you know what? The Lord wants you to be empowered, to be unlimited, and to grow in the environment that he ordains for you. So there's no limitations to anything if we will get our hope restored in our God, God will open up doors that no man can close. That's what he says in his word. He says, I've called you out of darkness. I have put my spirit in you. So we've got his breath in us. And his word is ignited in our heart. And we've got choices. I believe that God wants to strip limitations off of the children of God in the season we're standing. What has limited you? Is it that you feel devalued, not valued in your workplace? What is limiting you right now? Whatever that is, I believe God is going to restore your hope back and he's granting you a good future. Are we prepared to believe that today. And on this note, I want to close the meeting by praying for you today. And truly, we are going to agree with each other that whatever has held us back, if it's that promotion that has been held back, and just longer hours you've had, but you haven't had what you believe is your part, because you've given your all, God knows that. 
And God's going to bring you before the right king that will value you, that will see the giftings on your life and truly empower you to prosper. So I believe that is your portion today and this week. If you will remember that God says, I restore your hope. I'm restoring your hope. And you will be a great nation. Amen, Amen to that. Amen. So let us pray. And just remember what it is that you struggle with. Remember what it is that really steals your joy. If it is that you don't feel valued in your workplace, whatever it might be, if it is that your gifts aren't recognized, if it is rejection that speaks to you, if it is loneliness, whatever, abandonment, limitations, our God is a big God. Our God is a good God. And he says he's mindful of his people. So this morning, we're going to put it in action, and you're going to walk according to what you prayed. And I believe God is going to restore that back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bring the church before you. Father, we've heard your word this morning, and we believe your word. We believe that your word is yay, and your word is amen. We believe that your word has promised us that you are restoring our hope back to where it needs to be, in position for the blessings that you have. We believe that you have given us and you have grown the giftings within us in such a way that we are ready to step over and enjoy what you have prepared for us. And Father God, wherever there's fear, wherever there's limitations, we want to come against the limitations of negativity and things that have held your people back. And today, in the name of Jesus, we cancel the legal right of the negative thoughts for starters, the negative investments that have been made in our lives. Maybe words that were spoken causing such limitations. We want to come against every word of limitation today. And we today cancel its legal right. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us for thinking limited thoughts, thoughts that are without your interventions, thoughts that are only just lean on self. And we ask, Lord, today that you would ignite our hearts with the truth of your word. So that the word that we embrace and the word we choose to hold on to, which is your truth, will begin to uh, uh, make room for us wherever we go. Father, your word said that you will open up doors that no man can close. And so today we speak those doors open. And we, we ask, Lord, that you would make us so absolutely open to the blessing, open our eyes that we will see and not look down, but look up and know that where you are, you've already prepared the destiny, the future and everything that is needed for us all to be satisfied, be complete and lacking nothing. And so we come against every negative seed that was invested in all of our lives that you make us aware of it so that we can ask you to forgive us and we can uproot it and remove it off of our land in Jesus' name. Wherever there's debt, Father, we ask this very day that, Lord, that you would uh, uh, order our footsteps in the right direction so that we would live in the atmosphere of debt cancellation in Jesus' name, so that the burden of slavery could be uprooted off of our lives in Jesus' name. For we're willing to work, Father. We're not lazy. We're willing to do whatever you open the doors to. And so we thank you, Lord, today that the children of God will be called a blessed generation, a generation whose God is faithful.
a generation whose God is just, faithful in everything that He promises and produces in our lives. And today, the fear of future, we want to take down that fear. We want to cancel its legal right, the lies of the enemy that was listened to. And today, each and every one of us, if you've had the fear of future or the fear of not enough, we want to come against that or the fear of being misunderstood and not understood for what you really I mean, today we come against that fear in Jesus' name. That sowing and reaping that is taking place, that is not the Lord's plan for your life. The fear of loss is very strong in the room today. I just, it's like my antennas are up to that. And in Jesus' name, we repent for it today, Father. Repent for allowing a voice of of Satan to speak to us lies that we've believed. And in Jesus' name, we cancel its legal right because we choose the truth of the living Word of God. We choose to believe what God says about our lives. We choose to believe what God says about our relationships about our finances, about our capabilities and opportunities. And we open our hearts to receive the opportunities that God has for us. And we're willing to be satisfied in that and walk in the statues of our Father in Jesus' name. If you believe that today, will you just absolutely speak to God today? Just lift your hands and start thanking Him for restoring your hope again. Thank Thank Him for giving you the ability that is in you, that is all powerful to do all things through Jesus Christ that strengthens you. And he and remember, our God is faithful. And so we plug into His faithfulness today. We plug into His strength today. We plug into uh, every part that God makes visible to you today. And we thank you with praise on our lips. We're going to occupy the land that God has ordained for us to be in. The land of influence. The land of more than enough. The land where you are not misunderstood, but understood in Jesus' name. Every part of God's plan. Today, you connect to that and you call it yay and amen in Jesus' name. Hallelujah for that.